Hi everybody. We're going to do a quick introduction to the nervous system and some important terminology and cells that are responsible for all those important activities within the nervous system. So first let's start with just a little bit of trivia. Blinking causes your eyes to be closed for about an hour a day. Women blink nearly twice as often as men apparently, although I have no idea why that is because if you really think about it, Batting your eyelashes doesn't make any sense because you can't see anything when you're batting your eyelashes. Or maybe that's the point. Maybe they're just trying to blur out the vision. Anyway, your brain is about 85% water. And if you remember back to some early stuff, your body is about 67% water, which means your brain is much more fluid than the rest of your body. In fact, it's about the consistency of pudding. So typically, if we do brain dissections in an anatomy class, we use preserved brains because it makes it easier for us to see the different structures and they maintain their integrity. Otherwise, they just kind of go swoosh on the table and they don't do much for us. Your brain operates about the same amount of electro electricity as a 10 watt light bulb, although I'm pretty sure I've met some people that are a little lower wattage than that, but most are around 10 watts. The Neanderthal's brain was actually bigger than yours. The largest cell in your body is a motor neuron that goes all the way from the base of your spine all the way down to your big toe. So you have some cells that might be three feet long. The brain is going to use about 25% of your oxygen, so make sure that you breathe because remember why you need oxygen. You need it to make that stuff, ATP. About 1 in 12 men is colorblind, and the reason that men tend to be colorblind more often than women is because it's an X-linked trait, meaning if I have two X chromosomes, you typically think of that person as female, although it's more complicated than that. And if you have an X and a Y chromosome, which are two very different chromosomes, then you typically are considered to be male. Again, more complicated than that. Now, X and Y are very different chromosomes and have different genes on them, whereas the X chromosomes are very similar and have the same genes but may code for them differently. So if I have a colorblind gene on my X chromosome and my other chromosome is a Y chromosome, there's nothing on the Y chromosome to mask this gene over here. However, if I have a colorblind gene on an X chromosome and a normal gene at the same spot on the other chromosome, then this normal dominant gene will mask this recessive colorblind gene. So if I'm female and I have a normal gene on one X chromosome, I often won't be colorblind, but I am a carrier for that. Whereas men, if they have one copy of the gene, are going to be colorblind. They're going to show that trait. Every about half square centimeter, so about that big square centimeter on the back of your hand has about 12,000 nerve endings. Think about that. So if I have already determined that my when my kids start dating, I'm not going to worry about putting a chastity belt on them with a big giant lock or anything like that. They're going to wear giant woolen mittens that are duct taped at the wrist. No pinkies touching in the movie theater with my kids. And your body is more sensitive to pain late in the afternoon. We're often more tired, we tend to become more focused in on one thing like pain, whereas when you're rested you can tend to think about other things and be distracted away from any pain that you're feeling. Pain is of course very, very complicated. It's definitely a very real thing. You have pain receptors and pain neurons that send those signals to the brain. At the same time, there's a significant amount of pain that is in your brain. If you think about it, it's really how you respond to those pain signals. We think about things like pain tolerance or just your perception of pain. I'll give you an example. 
I used to think if I would go to the hospital and they asked me what my pain scale was or where I was in my pain at the moment, I would have said childbirth was probably a 10. That had been the most pain I'd probably ever experienced. And then I had a bile leak. So I had my gallbladder removed and had a bile leak about a week later. And I would say that my pain scale shifted so much that childbirth without an epidural ran at a pain of about two. So pain is about perception. Now, if we look at the nervous system, there are, it has one primary function, right? And that is, of course, to control and regulate. And it does that along with what other system? Yeah, it's going to help out the endocrine system. So the nervous system is going to control and regulate using electricity, and the endocrine system is going to do that with chemical messengers called hormones. There are two main kinds of cells. We learned about this with tissues. There are neurons, and they send the electricity. And there are neuroglia, which help to support those cells. So neuroglia support, nourish, repair, and insulate neurons. If you remember back from tissues, about 98% of your tissue from the nervous system is found in the central nervous system which is your brain and spinal cord, and the other 2% is found in the peripheral nervous system, which are all of those nerves branching off of your brain and spinal cord. Now I'm just giving you a quick introduction and hope that you watch the crash course videos because they get into a little bit more detail in the different types of glial cells, for example. So as we mentioned, nervous system, is controlling and regulating by helping us to detect changes, makes decisions, stimulates muscles and glands to respond, and helps us to maintain homeostasis. As we mentioned, neural tissue has two kinds of cells. We've got neurons, which conduct the electricity, and the neuroglia, which help to take care of them. Now, we can break the nervous system down into two major divisions. And then we really want to break those down a little bit further. So let's look at this. If you have your notes or you've pulled them up, then look at the very first page of the notes, which has kind of a flow chart of the divisions of your nervous system. And we're going to go over those right now. OK, so let's look at the divisions of the nervous system. We're going to start off up here with our central nervous system which is the brain and spinal cord. And then we need to have two different types of neurons that are going to be carrying information to and from this central nervous system. We need to have neurons that are bringing information to the central nervous system. Those will be sensory neurons. And we need neurons that carry information in the form of commands away from the central nervous system, and those will be motor neurons. So let's talk about our incoming information first. So this is going to be done by the afferent division. And what kind of neurons did we just say that those are? Right, those are sensory neurons. We can break up our incoming information into two primary sets of information. We're going to get information from receptors called somatic sensory receptors and we're going to get information from visceral sensory receptors. Now remember, the visceral layer of membranes is the one that's tight to the organs. So your viscera are your guts. So if you think about it that way, then your visceral sensory receptors are giving us information really about what's going on inside. So 
So these are receptors that are going to tell you if your blood pressure is too high or too low, if your blood sugar is too high or too low, if your muscles are contracting of the uterus and you can feel cramps, or a smooth muscle around the digestive tract and you can feel kind of stomach grumbling or digestive upset. So I'm getting internal information from these visceral receptors. When you think of soma, soma, remember, means body. So somatic sensory receptors give me information about my body and its relationship to the outside. So this is typically going to come from muscles and joints. So this is info from muscles and joints. about the outside. So this is going to tell me where my place is in space, whether my feet are touching the floor or I'm laying on the floor or I'm closing my eyes and I'm able to touch my nose. So the reason that you're able to stand there and close your eyes and put your arms out and touch your nose without missing, oh and I missed a little bit, that's not good is it? So the reason that you're able to do that, or I know that my left hand is now touching my forehead and my right hand is going to touch my chin, is because I'm getting information from my muscles and joints of my hand, my elbow, my shoulder, that are all telling me where those different body parts are. Knowing where your place is in space is very, very important and it's something that we call proprioception. If you've ever been dizzy or had vertigo, or the bed spins, or a disoriented feeling when you're on a boat or right after you get off a boat, you're having disruption in that proprioception. So we really take that for granted. I remember one time I had a, a kind of a middle ear infection and it was really irritated and couldn't get it to kind of clear up and everything felt like I was just walking around on a boat and what I had to do was walk down the hallways at Delta and I would just kind of touch the wall and kind of drag my fingertips along the wall as I would walk down the hallway and just that little bit of sensory information from touching the wall let my brain know where I was in space because I wasn't getting that information from my ear or from all my muscles correctly. So that's my incoming information. So now my brain and spinal cord make a decision about whether I need to do something. If I need to do something, then I'm going to send out commands through the efferent division. And these would be what kind of neurons? Right, these would be motor neurons. And that those commands are going to go out to two different places. They're going to go out to my somatic nervous system. And this is going to tell the effector, which are my skeletal muscles, that they need to respond. Remember, effectors carry out commands. So the efferent division sends signals through my somatic nervous system to my skeletal muscles. Now, can you control your skeletal muscles? Yes. So this division is generally voluntary. But I also have lots of involuntary commands that go out. And those are going to go out to your autonomic nervous system. Now, your autonomic nervous system, your ANS, you can think of it as being automatic. So the autonomic is automatic. It can be subdivided into two divisions, the sympathetic, and the parasympathetic. Now, 
rather than kind of try to squeeze this in down here, let's move to another slide. So let's take a look at our autonomic nervous system, or the ANS. It can be divided into the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Now you may have heard of these before if you've ever heard of fight or flight. So sympathetic division is your fight or flight response, which means your parasympathetic is going to give you rest and digest responses. Now, I want you to think for a minute, and rather than me just giving you a whole laundry list of things that happen when you are stimulated by your sympathetic or parasympathetic divisions, I want you to get a piece of paper, pause the video, and first just try to write down a list of as many things you can think of that are happening to your body or that you feel when you're going into fight or flight mode. So you just got really bad news on um, the phone or a really recent and good example would be all of a sudden an emergency alert comes up on your phone or your watch that tells you a dam is about to break and you need to evacuate or a deer runs in front of the car. Any of these things would be fight or flight mode. So pause the video and write down as many as you can think of and then come back here and we'll go over just at least a few um, examples. Okay, so let's look at fight or flight. What are some of the things that happen to your body when you're really stressed out? Well, you might have come up with an increased heart rate. And if your heart's racing, you might be stress breathing, right? So you might have increased respiratory rate. So you get fast, shallow breathing or hyperventilating. And if that goes on long enough, you don't get enough oxygen, you can feel like you're going to pass out. You might have said that you're, you have a increased blood pressure. You might feel flushed and your muscles feel ready to go. And that's because we're going to increase blood to the skin and skeletal muscles. We're also not worrying about some of our body parts right now. So we are going to decrease blood to pretty much all of your abdom abdominal organs. So to your digestive, urinary, and reproductive tracts. Your pupils are going to dilate so we can let more light in, so we can see better for that emergency. We're going to decrease saliva production or digestive enzymes in general because of course we're decreasing digestive function. We're decreasing urinary urine production although you may feel a need to urinate to empty what's there. You are going to have increased sweat because that's part of stimulating our skin. And you probably came up with some other ideas as well. And there are a lot of other things that happen. What happens then if I'm in rest and digest mode? Well, my heart rate's going to go back to resting levels. My respiratory rate is going to become deeper and slower. My blood pressure is going to go back to resting levels. And you might kind of start seeing a pattern here, which is that it's going to be the opposite of all of this happening. So you don't really have to memorize two things, you just memorize one and you've got the other one. Now we're going to leave off there. Make sure that you watch the other videos, including the crash course videos, um, take notes, and pay close attention to things like types of receptors and types of cells that are involved.